Hi, my name is Rachel Folk. I'm professor of art history at Ferris State University and also a board member at Artworks. And it's my pleasure today to be presenting Sunflower Power, Women's Empowerment in Art as a recorded lecture that is designed to work with our current Smithsonian exhibition, Voices and Votes. I hope you've gotten a chance to see the exhibit or you're gonna make your way into artwork soon to um, take a look at all the material that we have there. Um, my interest is in the visual arts and I'm also um, an avid gardener and I love sunflowers and I'm excited to talk to you today about um, the really powerful symbolism of flowers and in particular, the symbolism of the sunflower as it was employed by um, two American artists. And um, of course, flowers have many meanings, um, but we'll see how um, they were used by two artists, namely Mary Cassatt and Faith Ringgold. We're looking at the two paintings that are going to be the subject of today's discussion. Um, we're gonna begin chronologically and consider Mary Cassatt and her Woman with the Sunflower um, painting. First, I just wanna show you a couple of images of Mary Cassatt. Um, she lived between 1845 and 1926. She was an American painter and printmaker born in Allegheny, Pennsylvania in um, 1845. She was also a student at the Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, uh, but she made her way to Paris. Um, she studies art in Paris beginning in 1865 and really travels all around Europe studying the great works of art. Uh, she does return briefly to the United States in 1870, uh, but she's drawn back to Europe and drawn back specifically to Paris uh, in 1874 when she settles there. She had her work accepted into the Paris Salon, uh, which was the place um, that you wanted to exhibit art uh, during the 19th century. Um, she also befriended Edgar Degas, and the two artists often worked closely together. She exhibited 12 works in the 1879 uh, Impressionist exhibit, um, which uh, sort of founds the uh, Impressionist movement. And she continues to exhibit with the Impressionists as an Impressionist until 1886. Much of her work focuses on the lives of women and the lives of women and children probably in part because that's what she had access to as a woman in the 19th century. Um, you know, domestic scenes, these uh, private scenes of children and uh, women and children were available to her as a woman. Um, but it's also a subject that I think must have been very powerful for her. Um, you can see here her children playing at the beach from 1884, um, or here, uh, the child's bath, which probably shows us a mother and child. And you see the real closeness and the intimacy of a mother bathing her child in the home. Um, look at the closeness of touch and care and just how much sort of quiet care is being communicated by this painting. Um, so Mary Cassatt was really considered a new woman, quote unquote, of the 19th century. Um, this was a time when women were gaining more and more access to rights. Um, and in the 19th century, and of course into the 20th century, she was able to take advantage of that. Um, she was highly trained. She was given access to schooling um, and, you know, exhibited alongside and, you know, pretty much on the same playing field as her male counterparts. She was also a supporter of women's suffrage, that is the woman's, women's right to vote. And I think we can see that um, expressed in this painting, which I will speak to shortly. I want to highlight, though, um, another interesting um, fact about um, Mary Cassatt's biography, and that is that she purposely never marries. For her, um, it was a way of maintaining her independence not to be attached to a husband. 
um, and not to have children. So while she um, certainly shows us a lot of mothers and children um, and obviously has friendships and closeness with many mothers, um, she herself um, does not feel that she needs to um, do that in her own life. So, um, you know, an interesting approach not marrying as a way of maintaining independence in the 19th and into the 20th century. Now let's turn to this painting by Mary Cassatt, The Woman with a Sunflower from about 1905. Um, you can see like the other paintings I've shown you um, and others that you're probably familiar with if you know Mary Cassatt's work. We see a mother and a child here. Uh, the mother is beautifully dressed. We appear to be in a private home. Uh, we can see a young girl uh, naked sitting on her mother's lap. This certainly suggests that we're in the privacy of a home. And the young girl holds up a mirror and looks at her own face, uh, which kind of gives us an interesting view as viewers looking uh, both at the child and the child's reflection. Uh, the woman here holds the child carefully, um, you know, softly, also holds the mirror. And then we get another mirror uh, on the wall behind our two figures. So we're getting a lot of interesting viewpoints and it really seems like the act of viewing uh, is highlighted in this particular painting. That sunflower though has really gained um, a lot of attention lately. And I wanna highlight the work of Nikki Georgopoulos um, here in her blog that was posted just recently on the website of the National Gallery of Art. And I'm gonna include a link to this. This is a screenshot here, but I'll include a link to this at the end of my presentation. And what's so interesting about Drogopoulos's work is she asks us to consider the sunflower not as a decoration, but as a symbol carrying meaning. It had been sort of dismissed. I'll go back to the painting for a moment. Um, many scholars, art historians, had looked at the flower and found its color interesting. Uh, they had written about the way it corresponds with the color of the woman's uh, clothing, her long sleeve there, um, and, you know, take an interest in the pattern and the texture. Um, but Georgopoulos really asks us to see it um, in another way, to note its meaning. And she links the sunflower to buttons and flowers, sunflowers, of the women's suffrage cause. And I'm showing you a couple of examples here on the screen. Um, the uh, National American Women's Suffrage Association adopted a new logo with the sunflower around 1896. And you can see um, an example of that on the left. We see the recognizable sunflower with the dark center and the bright yellow petals and then the year 1848 in the center of the sunflower. Um, and that is drawing to mind, commemorating the date of the Seneca Falls Convention. You can see um, in the button on the right uh, from 1904, um, here another sunflower and the phrase, we want to vote for president in 1904. Um, so you see how this um, sunflower endures in the history of women's suffrage and in the visual symbols that uh, women and men, mostly women, uh, but women and men uh, fought for in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and I will note that the sunflower had been previously used by the suffrage campaign of 1867 in, Can in Kansas, uh, where the sunflower is the state flower. Um, so this may speak to some of the origins of the use of the sunflower, as well as the color yellow, uh, together with purple and white, uh, which are the traditional colors of the suffrage movement. So if we look at the painting of um, Mary Cassatt, Woman with a Sunflower, side by side with these buttons, as Georgopoulos does in her research, I think we can see that we have a very, very close comparison here. And we should probably think of that sunflower not just as decoration, but as a symbol of 
uh, this woman, whoever she is, of, of her support of women's suffrage and also of the artist um, Mary Cassatt's support of uh, the women's right to vote and women's suffrage. We know that Cassatt supported the cause of suffrage. Um, this is not something that we have to, um, you know, just sort of uh, hypothesize. We actually know that she was a supporter of suffrage. Um, and in fact, several of Cassatt's works were exhibited in uh, an exhibit at the Nodler Gallery in New York City. Um, and this exhibit was organized by Louisine Havemeyer. Um, and you can see here um, a, an artifact from that. Um, and you, I think it's important to note as you look here at um, the announcement, uh, there were going to be exhibits uh, or works of art um, from the, the work of uh, Mary Cassatt as well as Edgar Degas. Um, and it's note, interesting that they're called both old and modern painters. Um, and notice as you look at the admission, it's $1. And the, the uh, $1 admission fee is for the benefit of the suffrage campaign of 1915. Um, so it is very clear that um, this exhibit is going to, or the proceeds of this exhibit, I guess I should say, um, will benefit women's suffrage. Um, and you can see that um, Mrs. Havemeyer was going to speak on April the 6th briefly on Mary Cassatt's work and Edgar Degas' work. And admission that day to hear the lecture and see the work would uh, cost $5. Um, so Mary Cassatt is allowing her work, giving her work over uh, to be part of that exhibit. And Mary Cassatt was very proud of Louisine Havemeyer and said so in a letter to her, really giving um, Havemeyer credit for organizing this exhibit. And um, I'll just read a, a short quote uh, from that letter. She says, quote, the time has finally come to show that women can do something. So in the visual comparison between these sunflower um, buttons, and of course women would also wear sunflowers or paper sunflowers as well. In the visual comparison, as well as in um, the moments of history that we can recover uh, through artifacts such as this and the letters that Cassatt exchanged with Havemeyer, uh, we know that Cassatt was a supporter of suffrage. And as um, Nikki Georgopoulos um, notes in her blog, um, it seems very, very likely that that sunflower is helping to communicate the artist's support for, the women, for women's right to vote. And of course, that brings us back to the two women in the painting, a mother and a daughter in a private moment. Um, of course, we wonder if this mother is thinking about um, the future of her daughter, if her daughter uh, will ultimately have the right to vote. And of course, that's something that it appears this woman is fighting for and supporting uh, by wearing that sunflower, that large sunflower, uh, so prominently in this painting. I want to turn now to our next artist. Her name is Faith Ringgold. Um, she was born in 1930 and she is still alive, still with us today. Um, she too is an American artist, an African American artist who was born and raised in Harlem in New York City and still lives there today. Growing up, she was surrounded by a vibrant art scene uh, that is the scene of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and so the visual arts, the literary arts, and the musical arts were a very important and formative element of her life. She attended City College in New York City. Um, she actually wanted to major in art. She wanted to uh, make art, but she was encouraged at the time to study education. Um, and she says quite clearly um, in interviews that this was considered more appropriate at the time for women. 
uh, women were not supposed to, at least according to society, prevailing um, opinions in society, women were not supposed to have professional careers in the arts, but it was acceptable for women to be teachers. So she gets her degree in education um, and goes on to become a teacher in the New York public school system. Um, and again, in interviews, she does talk about how this was very formative and working with children and the creativity of children was something that really inspired and influenced her. Um, of course, she does go on to become a professional artist, a very um, inspirational and well-known artist. Um, and she taught, she actually uh, writes children's books that she illustrates with her own art. So she, in addition to making gallery pieces uh, like the one we're going to discuss today, um, she also continues, um, in a sense, to educate by writing children's books. In 1959, she uh, um, earns her master's degree from City College, and shortly thereafter, she travels um, to Europe with her daughters, which uh, we'll see shortly, um, inspires some of the work that we're going to consider today. By the 1960s and the 1970s, she is compelled to become an activist artist. Um, she feels during those turbulent times um, that it's important for visual artists uh, to also be activists. And you're looking at just one of her paintings here, the United States of Attica from 1971 to 1972, uh, which is, as you can see at the bottom, a map of American violence. Um, and it calls out uh, the various atrocities, the various acts of uh, violence that are part of America's history. Um, from the genocide of Native Americans um, to um, much more recent wars. Um, so this actually shows the death tolls of different American wars and conflicts and asks Americans to confront the violent history of this country. What I'm going to focus on today um, are some of Faith Ringgold's story quilts um, of the 1980s, which she begins making the story quilts in the 1980s. And we're gonna look at a couple from the 1990s. Um, and these quilts are really interesting in terms of subject matter, but also in terms of medium, that is how they are made. Um, we have acrylic paint that Faith Ringgold applied to canvas. That's what's in the center um, of the painting. And then we have um, dyed and pieced fabric um, on the border. And um, all of it is quilted with quilting stitches bringing it together. Now, this is meant to tap into um, some very important traditions for Faith Ringgold. It taps into women's arts. Um, the making of quilts, the making of textiles, um, has long been considered a, an art form of women. And sometimes because quilting was considered a woman's art, um, it wasn't always traditionally in art circles given the same prominence, given the same respect as a more traditional painting. Um, and here Faith Ringgold certainly means to counter that idea. Um, by weaving together uh, fabric and paint. Quilts also very importantly recall the arts of enslaved people in the United States. Most slave owners did not allow enslaved people to read or write or even to keep belongings. Quilts though were allowed because they were seen as utilitarian and enslaved people used them to keep warm. Over time, quilts became a mode of storytelling and a mode of communication for enslaved people. And Ringgold here is really building upon that tradition with her quilts of the 1980s and the 1990s. And she honors both women's traditions and black traditions with her quilts. I'm showing you here um, an example from her so-called French collection, which shows an experience of an African-American family 
in France. You can see that this particular quilt is called Dancing at the Louvre, and that's exactly what we see. Um, these story quilts are told through the eyes of a woman named Willia Marie Simone. And here she is dancing with her daughters um, at the Louvre. Um, I'm sorry, I, should, I have the, the name quite uh, incorrect there. Um, the mother here is Marcia, and Willia Marie Simone is uh, one of the younger people. So Marcia and her three little girls took me dancing at the Louvre. I thought I was taking them to see the Mona Lisa. You've never seen anything like this. Well, the French hadn't either. Never mind Leonardo da Vinci and Mona Lisa. Marcia and her three girls were the show. So Walia is there with uh, Marcia and the three daughters. And we can recognize um, the place that is the Louvre Museum from the parquet floor uh, to the works of Leonardo on the wall. But you can see that this quilt is about that art, certainly, but it's also, I think, much more about the experience of this family at the Louvre and the joy that they feel being in this place and the joy that they really feel being with each other. Uh, notice that many of the figures look out uh, from the quilt and it's almost like um, the paintings are or the people in the paintings are looking at Marcia and her three little girls, as well as Willia Marie Simone and their enjoyment, their experience in the Louvre. Um, so, you know, this series of quilts, I, I don't have time to show them all today, but these series of quilts confront traditional Western, that is European art history with new stories and experiences where we see um, African-American people, particularly many African-American women, um, in these familiar places from art history like the Louvre. Um, and we see new stories and new experiences, really a new history being made. Um, I want to turn now to the sunflowers, the topic of today, to consider this quilt, which is part of that French collection, um, this one's called Sunflower Quilting Bee at Arles, um, also from 1991, and also acrylic painting on canvas with pieced fabric at the border. Now, the quote I read you earlier, and the quote that is on the screen now, these are from inscriptions that actually Faith Ringgold put onto these quilts. So there is a combination of art and text. There is visual storytelling, but also storytelling with words. Um, and this is all the creation of Faith Ringgold. So I want to uh, read to you the, you can see as you look at this quilt, it's actually surrounded um, with writing. And then we've got this beautiful imagery um, of this gathering, the quilting bee, at Arles in the south of France. And I'm going to read to you um, what Faith Ringgold has put on the quilt and the story that is being told. The National Sunflower Quilters Society of America are having a quilting bee in sunflower fields around the world to spread the cause of freedom. Aunt Melissa has written to inform me of this and say, Go with them to the sunflower fields in Arles, and please take good care of them in that foreign country, Willia Marie. These women are our freedom, she wrote. Today the women arrived in Arles. They are Madame Walker, Sojourner Truth, Ida Wells, Fanny Lou Hamer, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Ella Baker a fortress of African-American women's courage with enough energy to transform a nation piece by piece. I've zoomed in a little bit on the quilt so we can look at the women and continue listening to the words that are on this quilt. Look what they've done in spite of their oppression. And we're moving left to right. Madame Walker invented the hair straightening comb and became the first self-made American-born woman millionaire. 
she employed over 3,000 people. Sojourner Truth spoke up brilliantly for women's rights during slavery and could neither read nor write. Ida Wells made an expose of the horror of the lynching in the South. Fannie Lou Hamer braved police dogs, water hoses, brutal beatings, and jail in order to register thousands of people to vote. Harriet Tubman brought over 300 slaves to freedom in 19 trips from the South on the Underground Railroad during slavery and never lost a passenger. Rosa Parks became the mother of the civil rights movement when she sat down in the front of a segregated bus and refused, it refused to move to the back. Mary McLeod Bethune founded Bethune-Cookman College and was special advisor to presidents Harry Truman and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Ella Baker organized thousands of people to improve the condition of poor housing, jobs, and consumer education. Their trip to Arles was complete. The sunflower quilt, an intentional symbol of their dedication to the world. The Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh came to see the black women sowing in the sunflower fields. Who is this strange looking man, they asked. He is un grand peintre, I told them, great painter. Though he is greatly troubled in his mind, he held a vase of sunflowers, no doubt a still life for one of his paintings. He's the image of the man hit me in the head with a rock when I was a girl, Harriet said. Make him leave, he reminds me of slavers. But he was not about to be moved. Like one of the sunflowers, he appeared to be growing out of the ground. Sojourner wept into the stitches of her quilting for the loss of her 13 children, mostly all sold into slavery. One of Sojourner's children, a girl, was sold to a Dutch slaver in the West Indies, who then took her to Holland. Was that something this Dutch man might know something about? He should, pay for all, he should pay for all the pain his people have given to us. I am concerned about you, Willia Marie. Is this a natural setting for a black woman? Sojourner asked. I came to France to seek opportunity, I said. It is not possible for me to be an artist in the States. We are all artists. Piecing is our art. We brought it straight from Africa, they said. That was what we did after a hard day's work in the fields to keep our sanity and our beds warm and to bring beauty into our lives. That was not being an artist, that was being alive. When the sun went down and it was time for us to leave, the tormented little man just settled inside himself and took on the look of the sunflowers in the fields as if he were one of them. The women were finished piecing now. We need to stop and smell the flowers sometimes, they said. Now we can do our real quilting, our real art, making this world piece up right. I gotta get back to the railroad, Harriet said. Ain't all us free yet, no matter how many them laws they pass. Sojourners fighting for women's rights, Fanny for voter registration, Ella and Rosa working on civil rights, Ida looking for men's um, getting out the lynch, Mary Bethune getting our youngins education, and Madam making money, fixing hair, and giving us jobs. Lord, we sure is busy. I'm so thankful to my Aunt Melissa for sending you wonderful women to me, I said. Art can never change anything the way you have, but it can make a picture so everyone can see and know our true history and culture from the art. Someday I will make you women proud of me too. Just wait, you'll see. We'll see, William Marie, they said. We'll see. So you can see in the images and in the story um, that this is a gathering of women who, of course, could not have all gathered in real life, but they're gathered here as founding mothers of African American history and African American rights fighting against slavery, fighting for civil rights. And we see them piecing together this quilt, um, and it is a very symbolic quilt, as we could uh, hear in the narrative, in the story, that is symbolic for the work that they have to do, or they feel that they have to do, 
in piecing together America and piecing together the world. Now, you heard the discussion uh, in the story of Vincent Van Gogh, who stands at the right of the women uh, here in Ringgold's quilt. And you can see how Ringgold has um, really studied Vincent Van Gogh's art um, from the yellow house that we see in the background of her landscape the portrait of um, Vincent van Gogh, that, which looks a lot like uh, his many self-portraits with hats, and of course the um, jar of sunflowers, very similar, um, sort of emulated in the work of Ringgold here. Um, so this is participating in uh, traditional art history, reviving the imagery of Vincent van Gogh and the beautiful colors of so much of his work, which uses so much yellow. But at the same time, um, it is a quilt that tells a new story. Um, it um, really highlights that um, people have been left out of history and people have been left out of art history. And um, Faith Ringgold here means to bring those things together, um, means to acknowledge art history, but also ask viewers to acknowledge um, a deeper and more full and complete history. Um, and here she is really celebrating um, these important African-American women um, who contributed so much to the United States, and she places them more broadly here in world history um, as much as in history of the United States. And uh, just showing you um, the wider view one more time so you can appreciate Faith Ringgold's process. Um, and you can also, of course, see the names of all of the women um, who Ringgold calls a fortress of African American women's courage with enough energy to transform a nation piece by piece. I'll come back to uh, images of both um, works of art today. And as I conclude, I ask you to think about how both Mary Cassatt and Faith Ringgold remind us of the symbolic power of flowers. Of course, they also remind us of the power of women women who fought for suffrage, women who were mothers, women who fought against slavery, women who fought for civil rights. Civil rights. These artists, Mary Cassatt and Faith Ringgold, also help us to remember that um, history is, is a very complex story. And we need to make sure that we're telling a full history, a complex history a history that includes all of our founding mothers. And I think we need to be sure to acknowledge the role that the arts play in telling history and the role that the arts play in activism. I want to turn to a quote from Faith Ringgold herself, and I've got it on the screen. She says, quote, my process is designed to give us colored folk and women a taste of the American dream straight up. Since the facts don't do that too often, I decided to make it up. That is the real power and joy of being an artist. We can make it come true or look true. I think that's a very powerful quote. Sometimes works of art help us to imagine what could be possible and, and you know, a better world can be possible. I, Welcome your questions. If you want to send me an email at rachelfolk at ferris.edu, questions or comments, of course, are welcome. I've also included um, some further reading. There are many, many books and, and many articles about uh, Faith Ringgold and Mary Cassatt. Just a few that I used um, to inform my presentation are here on the screen. Um, and I do particularly want to encourage you um, to make use of the internet um, and watch the many videos of Faith Ringgold. She gives a lot of um, interviews and you can hear her speak about her own work. 
Um, of course, that's not possible, um, at least on YouTube, um, for uh, Mary Cassatt, but there are a lot of great books and articles about her. And of course, we have many photographs and documents from her life. Um, so she's also someone um, that you can get to know by way of her art and the various artifacts that we have about her life. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you and um, to think about the power of art and the power of women and how we sometimes use flowers and we sometimes use our art to advocate for very important things. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Be well.